Welcome to MindShift, I'm Brandon. Today is episode 45 of my secular Bible study series where we are covering Romans, one that I have been both looking forward to and have been pretty hesitant to want to cover. It's only 16 chapters. You wouldn't think that this is such a big deal, except that it is. This is Paul's magnum opus, in my opinion. This is Paul's most thorough working out of his idea and philosophy and theology. You could almost dissect this book line by line. Really, you could pull it out and say, look at the implications, look at the contradictions, look at how it shaped this or converted this person that led to this. Like, it is a rich text. Now, the good news is we have a lot of other text from Paul. And so since I am going to be covering Romans at a pretty high level here, I want you not to fear, because if we need to talk more about justification, we can do so in Galatians. If we need to talk more about reconciling the Jewish Old Testament law, we have Hebrews for that. So my goal is to give you in Romans what is unique to Romans, which is still a ton. Now, where this sits in the Pauline letters is the last of the major letters. This is written during Paul's third mission journey. He has had some time to come up with some of these arguments, to hear the objections to other things, to see how the churches are splitting and fighting and having a hard time reconciling Jewish tradition with Gentile conversion. And so he is getting a chance to put this forward ahead of him before he goes to Rome and to raise support for him going to Spain and say, listen, here it is. Let me lay this out for you. And it's fascinating because if you have been a Christian, you might not even understand how much of your modern belief comes from this book. How many of the excuses and apologetics that are made come from this book? How many of the things Paul addresses that Christians still have issues with? And hopefully I can highlight some of those as we go through. So we're going to jump into point one, book overview. We're going to break it down into segments. But before we do, I just want to make sure since this is the first writing of Paul that we have, we take a second to explain who Paul is. Now, most of you know, but Paul is from the tribe of Benjamin. He is a Jew. He was a zealous Pharisee. And by Paul's own admission, mission in Philippians, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He knows the Jewish law, which makes him the perfect person after his conversion to speak out against it and be the head apostle of bringing in the Gentiles. He was, of course, born Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus is in modern day Turkey, and at that time was kind of an intellectual hub of the Roman Empire because of the university there. If Acts is to be believed, and just for Jewish tradition's sake, let's kind of explore this. Paul is a Roman citizen, even though he is of Jewish birth. This affords him certain rights that come in very handy. Also, according to Acts, he was taught under a very famous, if you will, at that time, or renowned rabbi in Jerusalem, who was a leading authority in the Sanhedrin. And so again, he is very well versed in Jewish law and scripture. We place the birth of Saul in year five, and then between 33 and 36 is when he has his Damascus Road conversion, after he approves of the stoning of Stephen, which we also see in Acts. And then from that point, it is on. We have the three missionary journeys, we have his imprisonments, his shipwrecks, his trials, and 13 epistles, although some of these are going to be known forgeries, and we'll cover that as we get further into the letters. And as tradition has it, somewhere between 64 and 67, Paul is put to death via beheading by the Romans under Emperor Nero. And that is the quick overview of just the story of Paul. So now let's do the book overview, seven segments to break Romans down. And the first segment happens immediately. It is chapter one and just the first 17 verses. We have three main things that happen here. First, we have Paul's greeting and introduction. This sets the stage for his message and moves us into his gratefulness, which is the second part of segment one, where Paul expresses his gratitude to the Christians in Rome and his eagerness to visit them, which is a nice introductory note when you consider some of the more chastising introductions that we get in some of his other works. And then in verses 16 through 17, we kind of get a little thesis statement. I'll just read it to you here. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and also to the Greek. For it is in righteousness of God revealed from faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Righteous is the word of the day when we talk about Romans. And to understand that righteousness, we first have to understand the problem with sin or being 
unrighteous. And that's going to move us into segment two, which is going to pick up at verse 18 in chapter one. And I'm being more specific here because again, like I said, when every single verse is so important and we're trying to make these segments work, you've got to cut it off specifically. So that's going to go through about the middle of chapter three, specifically verse 20. So throughout the rest of chapter one, Paul makes his case for God's wrath against unrighteousness. And I am biting my tongue at all the things that are happening line by line that so badly need to be talked about. We'll get to some of those in point seven, so stick around for all the contradictions and problematic passages. But again, forgive me for being so brief in this very high-level overview. In the first part of chapter two, we get God's righteous judgment. So first we talk about God's righteousness, then we talk about the unrighteousness of sin, and now we're going to talk about God's righteousness to judge that sin. For who? For both Jew and Gentile. In fact, it's interesting, in this case gets made throughout the entirety of the book, that you almost sense this apologetic in Paul ahead of its time saying, what about the Gentiles? Was this fair that God kind of excluded the Gentiles from the beginning? And takes it a step further to say, actually, if you think about it, the Jews, the people who had the law, they're even more guilty. They had the opportunity to know God and to know his law, to become just, act out righteousness, and they failed. How much worse are they? But it doesn't matter because ultimately both Jew and Gentile are unrighteous and deserve the judgment of God, which is what is being stated here at the beginning of chapter two. For the rest of two and into three, it is that specific case against the Jews where he shows clearly that possessing the law was not enough, which leads to chapter three, where we get this universal guilt, a universal sinfulness that no one, Jew or Gentile, can escape, which leads us to segment three, and it's going to pick up in chapter three, verse 21, and go through most of five, and that's, but don't worry, there's good news. You can be justified by faith. Now, this is a big turning point. You know, he's taken a few chapters to kind of set the stage, and all of a sudden, after everything that has been written in the Old Testament, all of the, I guess, misunderstanding of the Jews for their own word on the importance of following the law and being blessed or cursed by your following of the law, where we see God double down on this, triple down on this, quadruple down on this, where we get example after example after example to show us that this was indeed the case that God set up. Paul's going to say, nope, 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 y'all have it wrong. You're justified by faith. Things have changed. You know, like immutable gods always do. And so we get that description of by faith, not by works, by faith, not by law in the last 10 verses of chapter three. And in chapter four, he's going to start making excuses for how this happened specifically. And we're going to go all the way back to Abraham and look at how Abraham was justified by faith, which is kind of a picky choosy thing to do because in Abraham's time, they didn't have the full extent of the law. That's before Moses. So yeah, you can make a case for it, but what do you do about the fact that even after Abraham, who was one individual justified by faith? I mean, we already know Abraham was a unique case. He got to walk with God. He had a tea party with God and the angels. He had miraculous births at age 100. He fathered God's chosen people. He is the OG patriarch. There were exceptions made for him the whole way through. So just because he's justified by faith doesn't mean that God's plan for the rest of humanity, which was clearly laid out after the fact, was not via law. But do you see what I mean? This is It's almost exciting to see where the confusion starts, where the separation from traditional Jewish thinking into the new Christian movement is happening. And to do so, you had to pick and choose which parts of the Old Testament you were going to utilize to build your case. It's like nothing has changed. Then we move into chapter five and we talk about the peace that's going to come with that, the peace in God, the hope in suffering. And at the end of five, we get into the comparison of Jesus as the new Adam. We get Adam's disobedience contrasted to Jesus's obedience. Segment four then will be Romans six through Romans eight. And this is what I mean. We could literally spend two hours talking about Romans six through eight together, but instead you're going to get like two minutes. This is where we get all the familiar terms like dead to sin, alive in Christ, slave to righteousness, the law and sin, life in the spirit, future glory, and even the pretty one, God's everlasting love. I mean, it's absolutely crazy how much theology happens in these three chapters. And by the way, some of it's really pretty. You know, one of the things here that Paul is trying to accomplish, especially towards the end of the book, is unity. Unity for believers. Don't get so hung up and quibble over these small differences. They're not small differences. It's the Jews trying to uphold their Jewish 
tradition and what they believed to be the correct law and rule of God with a new age at the time version of almost anything goes because we're all so broken anyways and we can't do it and we can't fix it and we can't be perfect. So we had to put our hope in someone or something else and that's Jesus and the work that he did for us and it's this get out of jail free card and it's a totally different idea than anything they had ever considered before about what the Messiah would mean or do, etc. Like those aren't small differences, but that's almost how Paul tries to downplay it. Like guys, you got to work it out together. We're all going to have special gifts. We're all going to serve each other. Everything's going to be great. And yeah, it's like that message is pretty. And there are some nice lines in here, almost stoic ideas about what it means to persist in your suffering and move forward always, the endurance of it all. And I like a lot of that. I liked it as a Christian and I like it still. But the baggage that comes with this, the slave mentality, the lowering of ourself and what it is to be human, the idea of being broken from the beginning and being demanded to be more, but being helpless to do so, and the unfairness from the beginning between Jew and Gentile, and why we need a justification in the first place. Like, it is ugly, but it's disguised as beauty, as a good gift as good news, which will move us into segment five, Romans 9 through 11, where we hear about God's sovereignty and Israel's future. Romans 9 alone, my goodness, the things we need to talk about with this chapter, which we'll just have to do in its own video because we're not going to be able to get it. But you have Paul almost lamenting here, showing his sorrow for Israel and talking about God's sovereign election. And then back to Israel again and how lost they are, trying to pursue salvation through works, through the law. Silly them. Wherever would they get these ideas? And then by chapter 11, we're talking about the remnant, those chosen by grace and now the extended offer to Gentiles to be grafted in and included. Two segments left though. Let's do segment six, which is going to be Romans 12 through Romans 15, not all the way through 15, where we are going to get into some of the practical applications. Okay, so we've stated the case, but what does this mean? Where do we go from here? How do we live? Let's get into the actual ethical instruction here. This is where we get the verse about the true act of worship, of being a living sacrifice. Instructions on how to live in harmony and love, in how Christians should have relationship with governing authority authorities and what that submission or non-submission looks like. A beautiful idea that love is the fulfillment of the law. And then a very weird word, acceptance of these differences among believers. And it's weird because even though it sounds like acceptance, it's really creating a click. It's really creating the utmost in-group ever. Us versus them. Believers versus not. Uh, we're going to hear this from Paul so many times throughout his letters and instructions about how Christians need to handle Christian things within the Christian community so as not to blemish the reputation amongst the pagans or the non-believers. And it is a very, I think, disbeneficial pseudo-representation of in Inclusion that has had some horrific implications throughout all of Christian history. And then the last segment, segment seven, the last part of chapter 15 and into 16 is kind of a break from all of that because now we have Paul arriving in Rome, his greetings to various individuals within the church, his plans for his future missionary journeys, raising support, request for prayers, a warning against divisiveness once again within the Christian community specifically, and then the concluding doxology, which is this, and it starts at verse 25. It's always nice to read the beginning and the end of a book. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. It's interesting, you know, we'll talk about this more at some point, but you have this certainty in Paul, but it almost comes across sometimes like insecurity with his need to say that his gospel is the only gospel. He goes as far as to say, even if you hear angels preach something different, they're wrong and I'm right. And all of this coming from someone who never even met Jesus and is oftentimes completely conflicting with those who followed Jesus for years and then supposedly suffered a cost for that. And it is amazing when you step back and you just look at Paul for what he is. He was a Jewish persecutor of Christians that approved and helped 
murder the very people he is now correcting and leading and training because of a vision or more likely some post-traumatic stress induced hallucination because of his actions as a persecutor. But I'm getting lost in a book where I cannot afford to waste time. So that's point one, book overview. Let's move straight into point two, authorship and date. The traditional and the scholarly agreement here is that Paul wrote Romans. And even in the things that are disputed about forgeries that utilize Paul's name, which is about half of his works here, Romans is not one of them. We have a pretty good idea of when and where. It was in Corinth during his third missionary journey, and again, the years 57 through 58. The only question from the scholarly level is, did he have help? Did he have people that were dictating for him? And if so, was it done actually at a later time, even though it was describing events when they were? Were there any additions, any possible redactions? But generally speaking, we have a pretty good sense that most of Romans, as we know it, was actually authored by this man, Paul. So, save for those textual variants, we're in pretty good standing. And an example of one of those textual variants would be like the doxology. That's actually in some earlier manuscripts in different parts, and in some it's left out altogether. So was this just a nugget that someone really wanted to make sure was added in and in different times was done so in different ways? It doesn't necessarily conflict too much with the overall ideologies that are being pushed here by Paul. So again, it's not necessarily a big issue, as Paul would be the person who gives us this great apologetic it's not really a salvation issue. You know, this is part of what he says even in this book as he's trying to address the differences between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians is, but is it a salvation issue? Is this a righteousness or justification issue? If not, just love each other and work through it. Which, again, good advice. Nice to look for harmony and unity, something we still haven't gotten right in the 2,000 years since. But it's also a bit naive that just because something is not a salvation issue, there's not a major contradiction and not a major mutually exclusive claim going on here. You can say that circumcision or eating pork is not a salvation issue, but the very fact that those things were once required on penalty of death and blessing versus curse and are now not really that big a deal, something you can compromise on or something you shouldn't consider or follow because it is by faith alone, I would say pretty important, even though Paul sometimes and sometimes not downplays issues like this. But back on track for point two, Romans is well attested in early Christian manuscripts, specifically Papyri 46, which comes to us in 200 CE, the Codex Sinaiticus in the fourth century. With these two and a few others, we can really make a pretty solid case once again for the main core of Romans. The only issues, and then we'll move on to point three, would be we do have fragmented papyri, again, some of those textual variants, and we have interpretive translations where we can see that a scribe added on or clarified a confusing part or tried to harmonize conflicting readings. That's, I think, a pretty big issue. But again, when you compare the Paul that is depicted in the last book we covered in Acts versus this Paul or the Paul of other letters or the forgeries, like we already have some major issues here, yet alone the actual content that is so night and day from this immutable God's past. And so at some point, I think you just throw your hands up. This is our Bible. This is what made it in the canon. Someone's smarter than me with more information did this. I'm just going to go with what's in front of me here, even if it's totally different than what other Christians in the past had, or it totally conflates with what the Jews had, even though I consider that to also be canon. And we just kind of almost have to, because of the confusion and contradiction, if you're going to believe in this God, just say, it's done. This is the book. I won't look too hard at the bad parts or the confusing parts. I'll pick and choose as I go. And as long as I'm getting my information from within here, even if I'm ignoring or contradicting other information it has, I'll be just fine. Look, and besides, it's really about the relationship with Jesus overall. And don't forget, a lot of this isn't even a salvation issue. And bam, you have modern day Christianity. Let me give you two other quick example of textual variants. We have Romans 5.1 and Romans 8.1. So in 5.1, some manuscripts read, let us have peace with God on indicative mood, where others say we have peace with God, subjunctive mood. These are very different things. Is Paul making a theological statement or issuing an exhortation? In Romans 8 one, we have an addition or sometimes an omission of the phrase, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This affects our understanding of the conditions for those in Christ. So again, 
issues everywhere. Let's move on to point three, which is historical accuracy background, giving you guys some context. It's important to understand, again, the book of Romans is written to the church in Rome, which is a melting pot. This is the capital of the Roman Empire. You have all different kinds of ethnicities and religions and cultures and a healthy mix of definitely both Jewish and Gentile converts. At this time, we still have the Emperor Nero, but the mass persecution of Christians has yet to begin. It's a relatively peaceful time where these ideas are exchanged pretty openly. I kind of highlighted them, but we have three main observances that kind of come up as places of contention for these Christians in Rome. The dietary laws, the laws of circumcision, and just in general, the adherence to the law. I bring those up because I think that it does show kind of a real tension and trying of both sides to figure out what do we do with Jesus? If this was the Messiah and we are accepting that, I mean, that's a big implication to be a Jew. We're now living in this post-Messiah world that is looking nothing like what the Jews were taught the post-Messiah world would look like. But through certain apologetics about a spiritual kingdom instead of a physical kingdom and things like this, they've been brought on board. And then the Gentile inclusion. This is both very interesting for the Jew and pretty new idea for the Gentile. And so these three examples that I brought up provide a pretty good insight into just some of the many issues that are being addressed at this time because of this confusion and newness of the religion. In terms of archaeological findings, we don't really have anything specific to the Book of Romans, but we do have some things about the early spread of Christianity. I'll list three for you. One would be house churches. I'll put an example on the screen of a house church found in Dura Europos. This is not Rome, but an example of the house churches we would have expected to see in Rome and that are kind of described in the New Testament that we know were common for Christianity at the time. Something that is specific to Rome are the catacombs, where we know that early Christian burials happened, and we can see Christian and biblical inscriptions and frescoes found that show the belief and culture and ideas of these early believers. And then lastly, inscriptions and graffiti, ancient in Rome. This is cool, by the way, in general. You can look it up for anything. And part of that is early Christian graffiti. There is a symbol, the Cairo, which was an early Christian monogram for Christ that is found throughout the city, showing the public spread and acceptance of this idea. One of the things I probably should have mentioned as we were studying the stage, but fits here well in point three, is the Edict of Claudius, which expelled the Jews for a period of time. This was around 49, which leaves behind a predominantly Gentile community. And then as you get the Jewish people allowed to come back in and that intermixing, it really sets the stage for us of why Paul was writing letters about how that mixing needed to work, settling differences, and planning to visit in the first place. Let's move on to point four, a literary analysis. The genre is simple. This is an epistle. This is a formal letter written by an apostle. The difference, though, is that unlike some of the other epistles that are written that are more corrective in nature or dealing with a particular issue, this is a comprehensive theological treatise systematically presenting Paul's concept of the gospel, of salvation, of justification, of righteousness, of judgment, and again, has got to be just one of the most doctrinally rich books in the entire Bible. One thing I'd like to take time on a separate video to go through is Paul's writing style. And this is actually how you know that the forgeries are forgeries, because we have such a distinct, clear style from Paul, and pretty easy to tell when it's trying to be replicated and failing. But we'll get into that when we talk about the forgeries. But Romans, like much of Paul's work, is extremely systematic and <laughs> feels weird to use this word, logical. These are carefully constructed arguments. And maybe I got this from Paul because I try to do this in a lot of my videos, but he utilizes the diatribe where he states a hypothetical opposition, stating objections or questions from a different point of view or someone that wants to argue the opposite of the point to allow him to fill in the gap and address that. It's a great rhetorical device in general and Paul is a master of it. It helps to clarify complex points, and it makes it a very engaging and dramatic thing to read. If you want a good example of a diatribe from Paul, go to Romans 3 verses 1 through 9. This book also has great structure. You were probably able to see that as we go through the segments, but a quicker version of this is introduction, sin, salvation, sovereignty, service, and a conclusion. I mean, it's the simplest, most straightforward thing. It's just that it's so very complex 
at the same time. But this is what we mean about Paul's writing style. Because of his systematic approach and his thoroughness, he's able to take what is got to be one of the most confusing systems of religion, where you take this former thing, the Jewish ideal, and you build on top of it while changing it almost entirely and superseding all expectations that were ever there in the first place, while now bringing in, quite literally, the rest of the world into what was once just for a small chosen group of people. This is no small task. And to state it in 16 chapters alone is pretty impressive, even if there's a plethora of holes in it. Let's see if I can give you some unique features of the writing and then we'll move on to point five. One would be the extensive use of Old Testament quotations. Again, I think this serves the purpose in the diatribe. He's trying to still base it in the Jewish world while at the same time overcoming the Jewish world. The only way you can bring Jews along with you is to show, oh, it was always there in the first place. Again, referencing Adam, referencing Abraham and justification by faith. Again, we have probably one of the biggest uses of rhetorical questions, and a heavy amount of doctrinal exposition. So let's move on to point five main themes. I think this should be pretty obvious. So instead of explaining them like I typically do, I'm just going to list them and we're going to continue to move on. The first one is the righteousness of God, then the justification by faith, sanctification, unity of Jew and Gentile, and what are the new ethics? What are the new rules? What are the new laws? Christian ethics in general. Move it on to point six, reception and influence. I want to do two things. I want to give you kind of my typical answer, and then I want to take this time to point to some of those larger concepts. The first thing of note is Romans was a really important book to the early church fathers. So when it comes to church tradition, when it comes to some of the earliest apologetics made, you can see direct connection with this book, specifically by Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, and Polycarp. And let's not forget Augustine. In 386, we know specifically that his reading of Romans 13.13 13 through chapter 14 led to his dramatic conversion, and oh, the implications that would have. Augustine is who gives us the earliest and one of the most important interpretations of this book ever. So many subsequent writings from him on the book of Romans fleshing out these concepts most of all, I would say would be original sin, where he uses Romans 5, 12 through 21 to talk about the transmission of sin via the seed of Adam. And again, you could do this with so many other concepts and so many other church fathers or early leaders or interpretations. It is just massive in how the modern Christian today accepts this book and its meaning. Also during the medieval period, you have theologians like Thomas Aquinas utilizing Romans as a central doctrine and contributing more writings to the understanding of it. And Funny enough, despite all of its use with early church fathers, which would lead to some orthodoxy and Catholicism, you have it as a major tenet utilized by Luther in the Reformation. What I read you earlier in Romans 1.17, Luther references as the gate to paradise. Then you get John Calvin utilizing major parts of Romans for Calvinism. It's utilized in modern theology and Western thought, and this is kind of what I wanted to go through. So let me just skip to the second part that I wanted to cover with you. Here are the theologies that have been either fully or partially developed because of this book. Romans 3.28 gives us justification by faith. This is huge. Romans 5.12 gives us original sin. Romans 8.29 through 30 gives us predestination and the elect. Romans 1.17 gives us the righteousness of God. Romans 6.19 gives us the concept of sanctification. Romans 3.23 gives us universal sinfulness. Romans 6.14 gives us the relationship between the law and grace. Romans 12.1 through 2 gives us the idea of Christian ethics or living sacrifice. Romans 12.4 through 5 gives us the nature of the church or the body of Christ. Romans 8.38 through 39 gives gives us the assurance of salvation. Romans 8.9 gives us the role of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.34 gives us the intercession of Christ. Romans 11.17 gives us the inclusion of the Gentiles. Romans 9.21 is the sovereignty of God. And Romans 7.7 is the purpose of the law. 15 major theological points in one book of 16 chapters, each fleshed out, handled objections against, differentiated between conflicting ideas. I mean, it's insane what is in this book. And again, we could make an episode for each of these, but at least you know what is being presented here. So let's quickly move into point seven. We'll start with contradictions and end with problematic passages. And I'm going to go quick here and we're going to utilize the list. So first would be justification by faith versus justification by works. So Romans 3.28 gives us by faith but James 2.24, you see that a person is justified by works and not faith alone. 
I know how Christians try to marry these two. Well, if you really believe by faith and you'll have works that show it, you don't need the works to achieve salvation. It's just something that organically happens when faith is real and lived out. Like it's saying something totally different though. Romans 3.10, again, this universal sinfulness, there is no one righteous, not even one. But Genesis 6.9, Noah was righteous. We also know that Job was declared righteous. We have examples that say the opposite from the very Bible, from books of the Bible that Paul quotes to make other points while conveniently ignoring this to make his case for total sinfulness. Very similar with all have sinned versus sinless individuals, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but Luke's 1.6, both of them, speaking of Zechariah and Elizabeth, were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Yikes, that's another New Testament verse, supposedly written by Paul's companion. God's impartiality versus favoring certain individuals, Romans 2.11 says, for God does not show favoritism. Do I even need to give you any verse that shows differently? But I will. Exodus 33, 19. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And it's funny because if we go to Romans 9, 18, therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. How is that not a direct contradiction of Romans 2, 11? But I'm setting up a whole new case because in Deut 30, 19, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. This is the contradiction between free will and divine predestination. I'm not going to continue to explain all of these. You can look these up. How about the role of the law? Romans 3.31 versus Galatians 2.16. The nature of sin and salvation. Romans 5.12 versus Ezekiel 18.20. God's love and judgment. Romans 8.38 through 39 versus Matthew 25.41. Peace with God versus division. Romans 5.1 versus Matthew 10.34. Romans 8.1 versus Mark 16.16. That's about condemnation versus no condemnation. Obedience to authority versus obedience to God over man. That's Romans 13.1 versus Acts 5.29. God's election versus human responsibility. Romans 9.18 versus Romans 10.13. Let me read these two to you. Romans 9.18. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. We've talked about this. But in Romans 10.13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, you could work those together by saying only the people who have been elect or predestined by God will be the ones who call on him. So sure, all of those would be saved. But the way that he's presenting it, it is saying something else. Again, a lot of the contradictions come down to faith versus works. We can see that again in Romans 4, 5 and James 2, 17. And another theme that gets repeated is a universal offering versus a special election. We can see Romans 10, 12, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Versus again, Romans 9, 15. We just can't escape this stuff. Struggling with sin against freedom with sin. Romans 7, 19 says, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. But in Romans 6, 18, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Well, which is it? In Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But in Ecclesiastes 9, 5, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. This is huge. You know, it's something I just want to let's zoom out and look at the very fact that all of a sudden in the New Testament, we have salvation. We have a heaven concept or even a hell concept, an eternal rewards based system. Listen to what is in Ecclesiastes, which we know represents the rest of the Old Testament ideologies. Sheol, a place of eternal slumber where all men go. The role of the law, Romans 7, 12, Galatians 3, 23 through 24. Grace abounds versus not sinning, Romans 5, 20. But where sin is increased, grace increases all the more. Tell that to everyone who, from my Sunday video, told me that the reason I am not saved is because I am stuck in some sin that I refuse to acknowledge or repent of. But in Romans 6, 1 through 2, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And yet Paul would go on to talk about the thorn in his side, which is most likely reference to a sin he could not quit, which he also straight up says. Is this just inconsistency? Is this just Paul's failing? Or is it him not being able to make a clear distinction of an expectation of what happens when one is actually saved and how they actually act? Because again, when you get into contradictions with being saved by faith versus works, if we still have works that are holding us back, and James says, without works, faith is dead— 
I mean, oof, it's starting to get really tricky. A judgment day versus no condemnation, Romans 14.10 and Romans 8.1. No partiality versus chosen people. We've talked about this. You know, even the idea of God utilizing suffering to a greater degree, Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Just look at Job, Job 121, specifically my old favorite verse, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. It's nothing to do with us or a greater good. God can do whatever he wants. Praise be to him. Calling on God's name versus God's initiative, Romans 10, 13 versus John 6, 44. Again, more stuff on faith versus works, Romans 3, 28, Matthew 16, 27. And I think I've beat all those horses dead. I mean, the main ones are again, eternal life versus no eternal life. How we're saved or justified. If we should struggle with sin or not. If we're predestined or all have a chance. If we have free will or we're at God's determination. We see issues within Romans and Romans versus the gospels or Romans versus the other epistles epistles by Paul or Romans versus the Old Testament. Issues everywhere. So let us end with the problematic passages from this book. Romans 9, we could spend forever on, but just reading verse 18, which we've already done. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Now, if you're a Calvinist, you just say, who cares? Duh. But I think the rest of us could and should have a problem with an all-knowing, all-loving God with forethought and foreknowledge who chose to create every single individual, even though he plans ahead of time to not save the majority of us, with especially considering such dire consequences, if you believe hell doctrines, or even just simple annihilation and missing out on the gift of eternal life that he has for everyone else. I really don't understand how other than the fact that Calvinists have just come to terms with who this God is and says, he's still God, so what? Deal with it. And at least I'm on the in-group, which is horrendous to me. I actually think for those reasons, even though Calvinists might be more biblically accurate, it's one of the more egregious belief systems to me. Because you recognize how unfair and unjust this God is, and you say, I don't care. And even if you care, you don't care enough to judge this God, because you'd rather be on the in-group that you are in, and you happen to consider yourself predestined, even if you don't live like it. If you're a Calvinist, you should not have babies. I can't turn this into a whole thing on Calvinism, but think about it. If God only chooses some, and if we're to believe the scriptures, the few, why have five kids and risk it? You're almost guaranteeing to sign some of those children up for an eternity of torment, according to your belief system. It's disgusting all the way around, and it is the last thing that anyone, if they're being honest, would expect of an all-perfect, all-loving God. Let's read Romans 3, 7. Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Which is funny because it's the same excuses that, again, many people make for God that Paul is now moving down to the individual. If my sin brings about the greater good, why is it considered sin? And I think it's a really good question, or at least a really good point to show the inconsistency between what God expects and judge of us, a lowly, stupid human, compared to his vast righteousness and wisdom, when we have to use those same kinds of excuses, the greater good, to justify God's bad actions. Something to think about. Romans 13, 1 through 2, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authorities is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Now, I find two hilarious and somewhat contradicting issues with this. One, we are essentially being told that God is in charge and to blame for unjust governments, of which there are many. And it seems like the prescription here is to submit, because to go against them is to go against God. Wouldn't that make our entire country treasonous to God for being treasonous to our original authority? This is a major problem for all the Christian nationalists, and it is straight up contradicting with other doctrines and ideas that we get from the Bible about God first, the rest be damned. Romans 11.32, for God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. In the very same book that we get a clear depiction of predestination and the elect, we also have verses that could justify the concept of universalism. No one else sees this as absolutely hilarious. Romans 3.28, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. 
This is just kind of my one verse to say within the problematic scope of verses that Paul is 100% for the umpteenth time saying it is truly faith alone. No works cannot be part of the equation. This is the free grace theology. This is a major point of contention within denominations, specifically within Protestants and Catholics. Romans 5.12, this is our original sin verse. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. First of all, you know, Paul seems to be taking literally Adam, not figuratively, which there goes so much for all the Christians that have made Genesis allegorical and believe in evolution and things of this nature. Without original sin, you don't even need Jesus. Paul gets that. The way that Christians swim through this murky water is almost impressive. Romans 7, 18 through 20, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. So this is problematic for a few reasons. I need to look more into this, so I could be talking just completely incorrectly here, but I'm pretty sure the Pope just talked about how the heart is essentially good in the person, which seems to be in direct competition with what this verse is saying. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that it is in my sinful nature. And again, the sinful nature is original sin. Original sin is the need for recompense and atonement. There's just clashing theologies here. Romans 9, 20 through 21. But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? I can't tell you how much I hate the potter example. First of all, most people don't read it in its entirety, where Paul is saying for special purposes and some for common use. They use it as the potter can do whatever he wants. He can mark it up, he can destroy it, he can throw it away. Special use and common purposes might just be a way to say the difference between being saved and discipleship, or it could be something really horrible, like the difference between being saved and being destined for hell to bring about the glory of God by making it more special for those who receive eternal salvation, right? Like there are a lot of ways that this gets interpreted. Most of them are absolutely disgusting. And either way, it all traces back to this divine command theory. We are nothing. We don't matter. God made us. He can do what he wants. And even if that's true, the question is, should it be true? Does it point to a good God? Does it point to a just God? And the cop out of Christians is to use this verse to answer that. It is the case. And therefore it is true. And therefore this God is good. And I just do not think that all of those things follow. Getting back to predestination, Romans 8, 29 through 30, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and those who he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Predestination is real. Free will is out the window. How do you argue this except by pointing out verses that are in direct contradiction? And then don't you have a new problem? Romans 9.13 gives us a call back, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. You know, we're making the case even stronger for predestination, but also that God is not a God who loves all, who desires all, who has a plan for all, or at least a good plan for all. But this is the book of Romans. Where would we be without this book? Some of these things are fleshed out in other epistles, and even some of them are from the Gospels, but some of them contradict so much of what we see in other books. We get very specific doctrines that we utilize from Romans to make our entire case off of, and even if we can accept Romans, I think it is accepting a subpar God, a God who is what many Christians can't consider him to be, a non-perfect being, or a being that doesn't even care about being perfect, a hypocritical being a being that will be the potter to do whatever he wants with the clay. But the idea that this book is representative of a correct doctrine that is clear throughout the entirety of the New Testament, yet alone the canon in general, is false. And the way that Christians utilize this book for their purposes, even though it presents mutually exclusive ideas within itself, has got to be one of the greatest signs of the Christian ability to cherry pick and create what suits them best. It is a book of build your own religion. Here's the blueprints for five different designs designs, build the house you want to live in. And I think it is fascinating. And I hope that you have a better understanding of the book and its implications and its doctrines and its theologies than you did before this video. So thanks for being here. I appreciate it. We're going to get into 1 Corinthians next week. And until then, keep 
thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my iconoclast and Boris GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared, James, and Christy, my atheist advocates, Caleb, Imposter, Jeff, Jeffrey, Karen, Paul, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you just enjoy the content, please consider joining these fine people today.